I think of spells as amplification devices. In other words, I don't believe you can cast a spell and then do nothing in your real life and the spell will manifest or at least manifest in the best, most powerful way it can. So what do I mean by that? If you are looking for a new job and you cast a spell, but then you don't send resumes out, you know, like it's probably not going to be as effective. I, I think it, you have to meet spirit halfway. It's so nice to meet you, first nice of all. Thank to you meet for you having too. me. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. How did you originally get fascinated with the occult and, and just, you know, how did you, how did you get grounded in all this? Oh my goodness. My kind of pat answer at this point is just that I was born this way. Baby, I was born this way as Lady Gaga ah. says. I mean, and I think a lot of children, if not most children, have some kind of predilection for right. imaginal playing and magic. And instead of growing out of it, I just grew further into it. Now, at some point, did that feel like it was more and more unusual that you were doing that? I don't know. I suppose as I got older and I realized, well, other people seem to be less interested and they're more interested in, I don't know, sports or whatever, yeah. you know, it became pretty clear to me that I was kind of, I guess, an oddball, but I have right. two really incredible parents who mm -hmm. encouraged me to be the most me right. that I can be. So I didn't feel too, too ostracized about it, luckily. Can I ask you from when you said you were, you felt sort of grew up with, you started with this sort of predilection or, you know, what were those for the audience of the people that don't know and may not have the opportunity like Jesse, he accesses other things that are extraordinary, but this part, like what, how would it manifest? How would things express themselves to you? A little, if a detail or two, and I know in your book, you, you know, things you do talk about on your podcast, but just a little bit deeper. Sure. So, I mean, I, I suppose it might be helpful if I talk about now how it manifests and then maybe we can work a little retrospectively, but you know, for me, I identify as a witch and that word applies for a whole host of reasons. I was raised Jewish, though I call myself Jewish because I'm also <laughs> pagan and right. You know, paganism, I think, can be supplementary or complementary to other religions. I don't think you have to kind of toss out your religion of origin, though some people choose to. And essentially, it means that I have a spiritual practice that is in sync with the natural world, with the seasons, with the moon cycles, and with some kind of divine energy, what I call capital S spirit. And some of the ways I interact with that is through spells and rituals. And it really is just a practice that is both what I do and who I am, if that makes sense. So, you know, you could do that interior and never do outward facing things. And, you know, with your podcast and, you know, the witches emoji, I think you're inviting people into a lighter side of what that might mean. So when did it sort of start to, did you start to think that way about it, you know? Yeah, that probably came in my 20s because when I was a teenager, I certainly wasn't practicing any kind of malevolent magic. And I think most witches you'll find are very, very positive and loving, compassionate people. Right. However, you know, there there is sometimes an association with hexing and doing that kind of stuff. And that was just never something I was terribly interested in. The, the few times I dabbled in that came back and bit me. Right. And so once I became, you know, in my twenties and I started studying with my teacher, Robin Rose Bennett and doing more mm -hmm. in-depth reading, I just realized that this was such a positive force and the archetype of the witch is such a positive feminist energy mm -hmm. that I started identifying publicly and it became a just much more public part of my, my work and my identity. Now you've done, you know, almost a hundred episodes of the podcast, you know, usually the podcast has a guest. Yeah. So how do you decide the guests? Cause you could have guests that are into the darker side of magic, or you could have people who are committed to the lighter side. So how do you do your guest curation? I mean, some of it is very instinctual. It's, you know, having a show, as you both know, means 
I have an excuse to talk to people that I want to talk to exactly. and the people, right. It's just, yeah. It's like sad. you, that's why you're on the show. <laughs> Thank you. But the people that I'm most excited by and most curious about are people that are really stretching the word witch. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, they might literally identify as a witch and do spells and so on, but I love people who see their witchery as an extension of their artistry their creativity or their scholarship or even their vocation. I've had lawyers on the show who identify as witches. I've had mm -hmm. lots of musicians, tattoo artists, you know, so it really runs the gamut. And that's really what I hope the takeaway is for the audience, that there are many ways to identify as a witch and magic can express itself in a whole host of ways. You know, mm -hmm. I love hearing about, well, first of all, I, on my own way, I'm a Jewish girl who I, my way of identifying is more intuition and, in, in, again, psych, in a psychic, that's my relationship to Terry Akuza, who we just spoke about, right? Which yeah. is another story. I'll come on to your podcast with Terry and tell you that story because it's a crazy, it's a weird story. Oh, but I, I think that when you think about witchcraft or witch, witch and wizardry and, and it, it is, it is weaving a spell, but artists, Jesse, you do that, you know, with some of the work that we do, getting people to come into a story we're telling because we're trying to, to talk about something that might be painful or all great art is putting people into a state where they're just hyper-focused on something and communicating a visceral, emotional, you know, experience. And so I love, I don't think I've ever heard the definition extend in that way and bringing an artist. I'd love to know what a lawyer does other than if they're practicing law and they're making their case in the Supreme Court and they're standing up and, and right. Is that sort of how, what is, how does that express itself? Yeah. Well, I've had two lawyers on the show. One who is very public about being a witch. Her name is Phyllis Curat, who's, she's just an amazing person. But then I had a, another lawyer on the show who's a tarot reader. And she was explaining that she really bifurcates her life. She does her law and none of the people that she practices with know that she's witchy or does tarot. And she chooses to keep her witchery relatively private. She has a different name. She practices tarot under. And she was explaining that she'll do tarot to help guide her in her cases, to give her messages that give her strength to make sure that she is defending her clients, you know, the best way that she can. And, and really, I think magic is everybody's birthright and it helps us live our highest purpose and be as in alignment as possible with capital S spirit as we can be. Yeah. For people who are wondering, what's the desire to be a witch? Like what makes somebody who should, that would be interested in moving towards that direction? How do you, how do you help them take the first steps? Oh, what a beautiful question. One of the things I love about this path is it is so individual. And I don't mean that as a cop out, but unlike other, let's say religions or other spiritual practices, there's not necessarily, you know, the one book. There's no Pope of witchcraft. We're very fond of saying in my community, you know, there are certain paths that are initiatory if you want to go down those routes, but other people, they just kind of instinctively feel called to this path and they read and research and have a relationship with magic. And, and so I suppose how I start people off is just to make sure that they make some kind of sacred space for themselves in their lives. I think it's very helpful if it's physical, if you physically have a room or an altar or a little shelf, even sometimes I suggest a little Altoids tin, if you are really private about it, where it's, it's your one space that you're really focusing a lot of your magic, your visions, you put sacred objects in there, maybe photographs, anything, candles, whatever makes you feel connected. So that's really, really, I think, helpful. But I also think that if somebody is, is feeling called to express their more magical side, to really encourage them to trust their intuition. I mean, I love sending people to the library or a bookstore, go to the occult section, just see what book is calling for you and pick up that book. And I promise you, it's going to lead you on whatever path you're meant to go on in terms of expressing your, your own witchery. I do love the idea of your intuition because that ultimately is what sort of from where it seems to live for, you know, and, but when you think of the word magic, because magic will have a million definitions, a billion. How do you define 
magic as it pertains to you and the work you're doing? Like, what is- Or where yes. do you see it? Where do you see yeah. it when you walk out your door? Oh my goodness. I mean, I believe in imminence, meaning that magic and spirit is in everything. And so I, I mean, personally, I see it in nature. Of course, I see it in synchronicities, what some people think are coincidences, but I believe are a way that spirit communicates with us and shows us our path where, you know, certain signs and symbols keep showing up. Maybe it's a scrap of conversation or a bit of a song you suddenly hear. I mean, I think we've all had those moments where we feel like we're following the trail of cosmic breadcrumbs, as I'm fond of saying. So I see magic there. And magic to me is a force that transcends time and space. I think it transcends the material world, even as the material world is infused with it. And I think it's an energy that we can all tap into to help us really expand our experience of being alive in the most meaningful way possible that has us connected to spirit. I guess that's my right well definition. <laughs> no, I love that. So I've had friends, like very, very good friends, like, uh, uh, like they're good, good people, right? And it always strikes me why are really why are dark people really attracted to good people? You know, like they they're just set about to get in their way and and to take them down. Wait, you know, wait. Is that some function. Wait, I, what's the question? Like, why are good people attracted to why? bad? No, no. Why are bad people attracted to really good people and they just get in their way, pull them down? You know, if they can. You know, I think that. I also, I suppose I would answer your question with a question. What do we mean by a bad person? Because I think we all have shadow inside us. I do think that there are people in this world who are very evil and who express their shadow in very toxic ways. But I think we all are both of these things. And for me, I think those not, you know, those bad people or those evil people are just people who have a shadow side that they haven't honored and explored in healthy ways and integrated into themselves. And so when they see what you might perceive as light or a good person or an integrated person, I feel like they actually are trying to heal something within themselves, or they're so wounded that they want to take down the thing that reminds them of their wound. So I don't know if that's like the best answer but that's what mm -hmm. comes to mind for me you know with with witches a lot of times they get a very bad rap right if you go back to salem and you, you know, how do you <laughs> before you know how do you, salem they've been getting a bad well rap. i understand you know europe before that but here in america so yeah, salem, yeah. but it's like how do you deal with all of those sort of cultural stereotypes you know which are what people think that it is i mean that actually that tension between good witches and bad witches is so fascinating to me. And, and it's, it's actually become a large part of my written work is exploring the archetype of the witch in all of its complexity. Because I do believe that our ideas about what a witch is, so much of it is rooted in as much fiction and fear as it is in fact. And I think if you trace back far enough and look at where the stereotypical idea of a witch comes from, it really was born out of this fear that was popularized by the church. And it was this fear of powerful women, this fear of sexual women, this fear of nature. And so when I think about witches, I love the fact that people have taken this word, this identity that has been traditionally a negative epithet, and we've reclaimed it and reframed it as this feminist anti-patriarchal force. Mm -hmm. Because that to me is what a witch is. A witch is counter to patriarchy. And I'll, I'll say anybody can be a witch, anyone of any gender. I usually use the pronoun she for witches as a catch-all just because I do think it's inherently related to feminine power and power that has to do with nature, with collective, you know, cooperation as opposed to hierarchical power, with honoring the body and nature 
and not trying to divorce yourself from those desires and those feelings, which traditionally the church has had people do, you know, it it used to be, and I know there's a lot of wonderful Christian people out there and I bow to you. I'm not trying to paint everyone with the same brush, but But I do think that one of the reasons I'm so attracted to witchcraft is it does honor the body and it honors us as natural beings. And that's an anti-capitalist kind of message, if you think about it. And a lot of people find that threatening and radical, you know? Is our witches and paganism tied up together? They are. Paganism to me is like a much wider umbrella. Not every pagan would necessarily call themselves a witch. But for me, anyone who calls themselves a witch, I would probably consider pagan, even if they don't use that word for themselves. Right. Sense. When you think about when you, you know, you use the word spells. OK, uh, there's a few people that might be good to have a spell on them and get them from the dark to the, to the light. I can name a person. We probably all. Absolutely. Um, But what is that, you know, without giving away secrets, right. For you, but how does that, like, how do you think about a spell? Like, and do to, to Jesse's point, you know, is it something like where we would really hope to turn a heart, you know, from a black heart or a dark soul, you know, the spell might be enchant them with something else. Like, how do you think about using something that is, we all have power if we want to access that we we all have powers within us and we can be strong. So how do you think about it in a very like anecdotal way? Yeah. I think of spells as amplification devices In other words, I don't believe you can cast a spell and then do nothing in your real life and the spell will manifest or at least manifest in the best, most powerful way it can. So what do I mean by that? If you are looking for a new job and you cast a spell, but then you don't send resumes out, you know, like it's probably not going to be as effective. I, I think it, you have to meet spirit halfway. And a spell is a way to say to spirit, and I'm using that word very broadly. It can be gods, goddesses, deities, your ancestors, guides, whatever you think is is helping you and you're trying to be in alignment with from, let's call it the other side, though I think it's everywhere. And this spell is a communication device that signals, hey, I'm ready. I could use your assistance. Please help me. And here is the intention that I am setting out. And so it's like a beacon. It's a beacon, if you will. And I find them really effective, but I often say I'm a pragmatic witch. You know, I wouldn't bother with this stuff if it didn't, if it didn't work. And I do believe in also having to show up in your material life and make sure that you're doing what you need to do here with these rules in addition to the immaterial ones. Now, earlier you talked about community. You know, what is the community of people who are witches that, that you're discussing? Is it a wider community? How big is the community? What do you do? What kind of activities do you do with the community? You know, one of the things that's so challenging about modern witchcraft is it is decentralized. So, you know, we don't have buildings we necessarily go to or dues we have to pay. Mm-hmm. So it's tricky to wrap our arms around how many of us there are out in the world. There are Mm. many people I know who are solitary practitioners. Mm. They privately call themselves witches or they know themselves to be witches, but they're just doing it on their own at home or privately. Mm. And that's totally valid. Then there are other people like me who have covens, groups of other witches that I meet with periodically. And we do magic together and rituals and we celebrate different holy days and, and moments of the moon. And so it's a very wide web. And what's interesting too is, you know, whether or not they used the word witch or the equivalent word thereof, magical people have existed throughout history in every culture around the world, and they still do. And it's a fairly recent phenomenon that people have chosen the word witch or the equivalent word as a positive word to call themselves. But nonetheless, we've always had magic workers. And so it's not quite a community in the same way you might say, you know, the Jewish community. It's hard to track, but but we're all out there and we come in many different backgrounds and styles and, and different types of identities. You're, you're making me think about, you know, the use of, let's say, medicinals or, 
you know, we, we read a lot about, you know, even, you know, in, in this country, going to, na- like you said, deep nature to heal. And Priscilla just reads about it. She doesn't know anything about it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm talking, I'm not talking about me being, a, it's, but it's sort of yeah. a, a link to doctor and medicinal sure. practice. And so I, mm-hmm. I mean, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Cause that to me is, it's such a positive spin on it, you know? Yes. So uh, even though I've studied as a witch and have considered myself to be a witch for most of my life, I formally studied actually with a green witch, Robin Rose Bennett, who's an herbalist. And she is one of many, many herbalists who comes from a tradition of believing that plants can help us heal, but that they have both the physiological effects and spiritual effects. And, you know, I was just interviewing a wonderful woman, Karen Rose, who's an amazing herbalist and who's about to be on the show. And she was talking about, she was raised in Guyana and she was like, yeah, this is just what we were taught growing up that the plants have their own consciousness. And so you, you didn't just use a plant to heal the wound. You also communicated with the plant and had a magical experience with the plant too. And I'm very heartened by the fact that people are starting to get more turned on to that in the West, you know. Now, you've worked on sort of the portrayal of witches in imagery around, you know, different commercials or movies or things like that. How did you grow into that area? And has it been difficult to get your point of view across in that? You know, I'm just a huge pop culture junkie or pop a culture junkie. I've always loved music and art. You know, I'm a writer myself and have have dabbled in a lot of different art practices too. And so I suppose it's just the way my brain works is I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how this archetype expresses itself, not just in the, the nonfiction world, but in the fictionalized world, because as we all know, the stories that we ingest really can change our perspectives for the better or for the worse. And I think the witch in particular, you know, the the more negative portrayals also can be fun to watch if you're watching a horror movie. I think there's something valuable about unpacking the negative stereotypes. Why is it that it's often older women that are portrayed as witches? Hmm, I wonder what that says about us and our fear yeah. of feminine the power. Crows, the crows. Exactly. <laughs> so I think Exactly. So I think there are wonderful messages and lots of food for thought and looking at, at pop culture. And, and I also just enjoy it. It's just kind of how my brain works. You know, do you think you'll do more in that area? You'll keep going further into that area? I hope so. I, I recently was the occult consultant on the film, The Craft, the, the new one that came out a couple years ago. And that was so much fun. I've written kind of, I suppose you could call it a comic book, which was my first book that came out. And, you know, I grew up completely in love with everything Neil Gaiman did. And so I definitely can see myself doing more in the fictional space for sure. And what do your parents uh, think of what you're doing now? They're so supportive. I'm really blessed. You know, my, my dad's a musician, my mom's an artist. And even though Judaism is still very central to their religious practices, my yeah. dad meditates, my mom goes on goddess retreats. So right. you know, they're really proud of me. And they just want both me and my older sister to be good people. They don't care what the hell we are, what we call ourselves, as long as we're kind, you know. And what did um, your older sister get into? Did she into witchcraft as well she's actually into buddhism she's a jubu wow (laughs) yeah yeah but and what's great about it is you know (laughs) as a family any little you know tensions we might have as families have when we're communicating about spirituality we have these really rich conversations and Mm -hmm. the fact that we all come from it you know from different angles i think allows us all to like learn from each other and grow and find commonality too I have a question about the last two years, right, in the pandemic and and have, you know, you talked about you can't, you know, you have this gather with a group, your coven, but also have you found that, you know, groups are reaching out to each other because we we could use a little magic, okay, with, with COVID, <laughs> something, but what, are, you know, how has that changed or, or your thoughts around all of this? I think people are hungrier than ever for spirituality. Certainly witchcraft as one style of it has become more and more popular and more and more public than ever. But I think people in general are just longing for spirituality and for deeper connection 
with each other, with whatever it is. And look, traditionally in times of turmoil, as we're in now, people gravitate towards spiritual things because they feel like, you know, there are things that feel out of our control that are overwhelming, that are unfair and unjust. And magic gives us access to a new way of dealing with those challenges. And in terms of how I'm connecting with other people, I mean, Zoom, you know, I think has become, I mean, who thought we would be here in little boxes, right? Talking to each other. And for all the drawbacks and frustrations of that, there's also this amazing whole new world that's opened up. So I've led covens on Zoom and rituals and I teach Mm. workshops in magic and creativity And so, you know, technology has been helpful in that regard to help us find the others, as Timothy Leary famously said. So what is spectaculous? Spectaculous? Spectaculous. I (laughs) I just learned about this myself. So this was from my recent guest, Veronica Varlow, who's an amazing witch and a burlesque dancer. And she started her own thread of witchcraft that she calls the School of Spectaculous where she brings in kind of rock and roll and creativity into the way she expresses her magic. And what I love about that is, as I said earlier, there's no one way to be a witch. So different people are taking the older practices of witchcraft and they're adapting them into the new world. So there's no reason that somebody couldn't have, you know, an image of Billie Holiday on their altar right next to a saint, right next to their grandmother, you know, Mm. whomever you feel that you have that connection with and who's a guide and an inspiration for you, I think it's fair game. I wanted to say, you know, Jesse and I were very close. Jesse was really close and I got the privilege to to meet him and work with him with a different kind of magician, which is Ricky Jay. I don't know if you know. So Ricky was extraordinary and we did a little series with Ricky and, and, and anyway, and he was, he, he did his magic in front of us and, you know, he just was extraordinary, but he's so funny. And he also had very strong feelings. I mean, you know, first of all, he was very against the occult. I mean, sort of psychics. He didn't believe in that. He always felt it was always, do you have a thought around magic as his practice with, with, with a genius like that and sort of, how do you think about that kind of magicry or wizardry, I would say? Of yeah. Well, that gets us into a topic which is so interesting to me, which is the notion of the shaman. And so many shamans in different cultures, my understanding is that they are often kind of trickster characters. And as much as they are doing some kind of deep magical work, There's often an aspect of performance, of costumes, of tricks that can help people kind of get past their own self-editing, self-consciousness, and break through into new ways of thinking. And so I can't speak for Ricky Jay specifically, and and I believe you when you tell me he was not into the occult or what have you. Um, But I do think that there's a place for performance and magic to express themselves together. And I think that's a really valuable stance for somebody to have in society. You know, I think I think actors and musicians and some of them are kind of straddling that line between, okay, yes, I'm performing and there's theater to this. Mm-hmm. And yet I'm also tapping through and being a channel for something bigger than me. I think David Bowie is a great example of someone I would consider a magician as much as he was a musician, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the um, imagery in uh, the Tash and Witchcraft book, you know, what was that process like to select the the imagery? Because I imagine you had quite a few, you know, tell me, tell me about the book and just how you went about picking all the images, you know? Oh, sure. This was a dream project. And, you know, to kind of tie a, a nice little magical bow on things, this was the culmination of a spell for me. I have wanted to work with Tashin for, I mean, since I was a teenager and the amount of spells and visions and things to try to make this manifest. It's just, it really fills my heart that it came true in this beautiful way. Did you work with Benedict Tashin on the images? 
No, no. He, he and his daughter, I understand are now, you know, quite big fans of the whole series that my co-editor Jessica Hunley has been doing for them called the you know Lover. Jessica. She, we know Jessica. Oh, great. That's a different story, of course. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I'll have to hear about that one, but you know, <laughs> the whole series that she's doing is called the library of esoterica. So the tarot book came out, the astrology book came out. And when the witchcraft book, they were working on it, you know, we were brought together. So it really was such a group effort in terms of sourcing the images. And I can't tell you how much joy it brought me. I was like, I cannot believe this is my job right now. I get to look at images of witches throughout history. And not only, you know, the ones that you'll find in museums, but also from fashion and pop culture, from dear friends of mine who are incredible witchly artists, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, lots of debate and lots of putting everything into a giant digital pile and emails and just getting each other excited. And ultimately it came down to what resonated the most, you know, what looked the best and helped us tell the story we wanted to tell of the full complex expanse of what a witch is and what witchcraft is and what we could get rights for, you know, of course. Oh, right. Did that become a big issue? You know, Tashin is such a beloved publisher that it wasn't too hard to get people to agree. You know, ultimately it comes down to budget too. In some cases, there right. are people that just want astronomical prices for, for things and you have to be choosy about that kind of stuff. But well, you could put a spell on whoever and just get them to release. <laughs> oh, the more that we see, the better it will be, right? Exactly, exactly. So I feel so proud of this book because there's a lot of images in there that people have never seen before right. or, you know, images from artists that that we might not think of as being interested in magic and witchcraft that, you know, you're like, what, what is this painting of a witch that this person did, you know? And so it's been really exciting and really inspiring to get to splash around in those visual magical waters. You've had such commercial acceptance, you know, by so many people. I mean, in the beginning, would, did you imagine that, you know, this, this message would resonate with so many people? You know, I had mixed feelings about it. Um, in some ways, I believe when I'm when I'm feeling my most aligned, I believe that I'm one of many, many people who is a messenger for this message and, you know, that it's time to be delivered. Right. And that it's working through me when I'm stuck in my ego, my smaller brain. You know, sometimes I have anxiety about it because there are people out there who still have such misconceptions and fears about what witches are and who they are. It's still, you know, there are certain countries where literal witch hunts still happen, you know, parts of the world like Papua New Guinea and mm -hmm. throughout different African oh. countries and so on. Mm -hmm. So, and, and let's face it, there are certain communities here in America that would find a witch to be incredibly threatening. And so it feels important to me to put a positive face on it, but not to make it too sugary and saccharine and take away the darkness and the shadow, which is part of the archetype too, and an important one. I'm just, I really am putting intention out there that I get to keep doing this work and do it with joy and creativity and imagination and, and that my community is kept as safe as possible and that everybody is honored and Look, I have a lot of privilege that I can do this. I live in New York City. You know what I mean? That people, it's really hard to make people look twice in New York and in <laughs> progressive true. communities that I hang out in. So I feel really, really blessed that I'm able to be in public as who I really am. You know, when you're walking around, do you ever recognize somebody else that you've never seen before as, as being, having a kinship, but you can just tell from looking at them? Absolutely. And it's not even necessarily looking. It's like the feeling, you know, um, I imagine you both can relate to that sometimes too. Yeah. But also, you know, not every witchy person out there looks the type. There are certain mm -hmm. people who wear hoodies, um, mm -hmm. but let's Jesse, see. Jesse, your hoodie up. Come on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, there certainly are certain like symbols and signals that if you're looking for them, you, you're like, oh, I see. You're in the club. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Uh, Do you, um, I, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but your husband is a theater maker. Yes. He's a astounding playwright. Incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I love that. I mean, we talked about artistry and theater and 
you know, theater where I started, it, it is, that is magic, obviously. You're, oh, yes. you're in a room or wherever you choose to put your thing on. It's like, and then you're, you're changing the experience of the people. And it made me think of, of Ricky in a minute, it, for a minute, because it made me think about theater. And in the end, what are we trying? What is that experience is, is to get people to transcend and go to another place yes. and to open up their minds, the experience of something other than the sort of the, the everyday or the, the banal, the tedium of one's life. So curious what, if, if he is, how he gets involved in any of this or not. Yeah, he he calls himself a muggle. Um, he's not necessarily someone who practices magic or is witchy in any obvious way. What's beautiful about him and our relationship is he really makes space for who I am and loves this about me. And once in a while, he'll be like, hey, maybe we can do a spell or if I'm doing a ritual, he'll participate. But he's very much like a sci-fi Star Wars kind of, you know, oh, right. that's his weird. Right. So we complement each other in that regard, but he's not, he's not like, he's not, he wouldn't consider himself a witch by any stretch of yeah. the imagination. And it's a good balance. That's good grounding for me. But to get to your point, theater, and I think any kind of artistic experience, I've, some of my most profoundly magical experiences have been in museums, have been mm. in concerts, have been when I'm writing or hearing a poem, you know? So I think I would love to help people broaden their idea of where magic is, because I think art is one of the primary ways that we can interface with these energies. Yeah, yeah. so beautifully said. Pam, yeah. thank you so much yeah, for, thanks for joining on. us. This is obviously dear, dear, near and dear to my heart, so I'm really excited about this. And thank so for, for the audience, if, if, if you want, just to st send them to your a book or anything. We'll put the podcast in the, the oh, notes. Yeah. And everything. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm very easy to find online, pamgrossman.com, and that'll link you to all my books and to the Witch Wave yeah. podcast and all the other magic that I'm making these days. So thank okay. you both so much. This was such yeah. a joy. Thank, thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. Enjoy. Bye. 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 Bye.